And we are live. Welcome to episode 3285 of the Survival Podcast. Today will be a permaculture episode, though I don't think you have to even know the word permaculture to benefit from today's show. If you want to eventually own, or you currently do own, or you're just getting started, because that's kind of the angle we're coming from today, with building a homestead, we're going to talk about a way to develop a design starting with what I call design element zero. What is design element zero? You are your design element zero. And I'm going to go through today, starting out with the basics of five zone permaculture design. And I'll talk about what it is, why we use it, and how it's flawed if you don't understand the context in which it was developed and then adapt it to yourself and maybe remove some zones because not everybody's going to have five zone permaculture design, right? Um, life is not a class project. Life is life. We don't fit the person to the design. We fit the design to the person is what I'm coming at today. So if I did permaculture consulting, and I don't, so don't ask, uh, but if I did permaculture consulting, these are 25 questions that I'll be giving you today. And I would probably ask you more than that, but this would be a good start for you to start to get a, 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 an understanding of what you need to do, the order you need to do it in, what you need to not do, and how not to get in over your head by moving too quickly and putting literally the cart in front of the horse, because that's what literally can happen to you guys here today. And I just said literally probably three times more than I typically do in a month, but that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day number one today is Start9 Sovereign Computing. How would you like to have complete and total digital sovereignty? You can, and the site you're looking at on the screen right now, if you're watching the video, is how to do that. The Start9 Embassy is the way, powered by the Embassy operating system. If you can install apps on your phone, then you can run a Start9 Embassy server. You can do all kinds of cool things, and you can get off of what we call cloud computing. Because let me tell you a secret. There is no cloud. There is no cloud. There is no cloud. What, what the hell, Jack? Haven't you heard? Look, it says right there. Yeah, there is just somebody else's computer where they control your data and your ability to communicate. And I want you to think about it this way. Just the end-to-end -end encrypted messaging you can do. Every time you send a message on all these messaging apps, you're not actually sending your message to the other side. No. You're sending your message to the service that you're on, which keeps a track of it and puts it like on a shelf and saves it for later, just in case you did something wrong or whatever. And then they take a copy of it and they send it to the actual party that you wanted to receive it. Don't think you really need that. And you don't. Not if you're using Start9 uh, servers. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do with uh, Start9. You can run your own Bitcoin node. Uh, you can run your own Lightning node. You can be unstoppable with Start9 uh Start nine embassy service. So check those out today. Next up, John Pugliano and the Wealth Steading Podcast. Uh, you won't really want to check out what John's doing. John has been a member of our community for a very, very long time. And he has always come to us with the heart of a servant. He's a member of the Expert Council. I first met him in 2011 at a prepper convention in Salt Lake City. We've been working together almost ever since. And uh, I've really watched him enjoy, I've enjoyed watching him build his podcast up. Doesn't put out one a day like I do, a couple times a week, sometimes just four or five times a month, but always great information. Check him out. John Pugliano with the Wealth Steading Podcast to learn how to grow your wealth like we grow our gardens. And that's going to be one of the things we're talking about today, growing our gardens and our wealth. So let's start off with, what I find to be a flaw in the way that a lot of actually really good permaculture teachers teach zone-based permaculture design, especially in permaculture design courses, PDCs. And I would say this is also true of a lot of permaculture teachers. And again, there's a good teachers. I think they just omit certain things because as you develop as a designer, you just kind of move faster. And so sometimes you, you, you forget when you didn't know things and you don't tell people like this is the total macro perfect concept of a thing. 
but it probably won't be what you do in most of your projects because not everybody's going to have land that dictates having, let's say, a zone five or something like that. So let's just give you the basics of, of how we teach this. And a lot of times it's done with a series of circles. And, you know, they're a perfect circle around the house is zone one and then a bigger circles too. And that, th that's just to get you familiar with the concept. Zones are almost never symmetrical in any way. They kind of move the way that we flow because what they're designed to do is basically we start out with zone one is going to be a place that you would naturally probably be on every day on your property, assuming you got off your butt, stopped streaming Netflix and went outside. Zone two, you'd be there at least a couple times, a couple, three times a week. Zone three, you know, maybe you're there once a week. Maybe you're not there for a couple of weeks. Zone four, you might not, you might be there a lot one week and not go back for three or four. And zone five, you go there when you want to because you don't touch it. That's that's the basic mindset. And then you you kind of stack in, well, what does that look like as far as what you use the land for? So zone one is your kitchen garden, your vegetable garden, your intensive growing systems, your trellised vines up over your porch that put shade on your house and give you grapes or kiwis or whatever. It's the stuff when you walk outside of your house, it's very close. You can probably see it from your house, no matter which side you, if you exited your house, if there was not a door there, do you look out the window? That's probably zone one. And that's why we do things like herb gardens, kitchen gardens, um, smaller perennials, intensively managed perennials, things that need us at least most of the year to keep eyes on. Two, zone two is generally considered where you have kind of your small scale food forest. This is where you have your, you know, perennials that are like shrub size and they're dwarf trees and semi dwarf trees. And this is a place with fairly fine mulch, probably irrigated unless you live in a climate that just simply doesn't require it. If there's swales and earthworks, they're probably really kind of, kind of small. They're like wheelbarrow and shovel swales and swale like paths, right? That's what zone two is. It, it still requires your attention. It might be where you're doing your backyard orcharding, where you're pruning a tree three or four times a year instead of once a year. Right? Zone three is now we've moved out. And, and these zones generally in a perfect design, in a perfect situation where you have all of the zones, each of them is about twice the size of the previous one. Yeah. So zone three is pretty big space. And zone three is where we would typically grow what you would call conventional row crops. So this would be things like amaranth or quinoa or uh, sorghum or corn or potatoes or beans or something like that. Something that would be more of a cash crop or a large scale broad acre harvest and put away crop on a smaller scale on a homestead. Um, this would also, if you did it with intent, might include things that are more like garden crops, but they're very large garden crop system so they're actually small farms like a two acre market garden or something like that where you have rows of even though you're doing variable things you're doing tomatoes and peppers and eggplants or whatever but you have a lot so you have continuous large-scale harvest and you're managing that like a farm but in the way that it's taught it's more that it's a crop that you plant maybe you have to do a few things a couple times a, a year with it and then you harvest it so if you plant potatoes you might need to do a little bit of weeding until they get up and going. You've got to plant them. But once potatoes are growing, assuming they get enough nutrient and moisture, you pretty much don't do anything again until harvest. And that's why it's further out on zone three, because we don't have to touch it very often. We need to maybe look at it once a week, twice a week, make sure there's nothing needs our attention. And a lot of those times we don't do anything. Zone four, even bigger. Now we move out into farm forestry, food forestry now we're looking at full-size trees we're looking at multiple acres we're looking at a system that the untrained eye might look at and just say that's forest but when you walk through it you're like well that tree's food that tree's food that tree's medicine that tree's fibers this is an area over here where we're cultivating mushroom etc right so it's 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 that it's your larger broad scale food forest and then zone five is nature we don't do anything. Sustainably hunt and gather. That's it. Here's the problem. How many of you were sitting there listening to this, especially if you've never uh, 
if you've never heard me talk about this before and going, yeah, Jack, I don't have a multiple acre system just for that potato farm. I don't have a place for a zone three. If you said that in your head, good. That's the point of this. This is the flaw that we make when we teach this. You probably, most of you, have property that does not require a zone three, four, or five, or does not allow for a zone three, four, or five. You're probably better off if you can sit on your back porch and see to the fence of your whole backyard. And if you can sit on your front porch, and you can, even if it's a pretty big lot, even a few acres, right? And you can see pretty much your entire property boundary. You're probably looking at something that's a zone one, two design or maybe a zone one, two, four design, because you're probably not going to have full let go nature anywhere. Some I've seen people like leave a little weedy corner in a backyard and call it a zone five or it's like a token. It's a permaculture virtue signaling, but the, the, but at least maybe the swallowtail butterflies or something will appreciate it. Right. Uh, in, in a suburban situation, it's, it's, it's even with a big lot, say three quarters of an acre, half an acre, you probably are just a zone one, two design. You, you put the stuff that you're going to mess with once or twice a week at the furthest distances based on natural flow. But then the biggest thing that we leave out, and I've seen permaculture teachers start to add this term, zone zero, right? Zone zero then becomes the inside of the house. So this is where we talk about things like, you know, solar electricity and good insulation and all that. And that's all fine. And that's just sustainable building. That, that's, that's just the way I look at that, right? Um, and most people your house is going to be there when you buy the property. So design is really more a feng shui element and picking your colors and maybe retrofitting some uh, energy efficiency in or something. Like, I don't really see that as permaculture design. I think if we're going to look at a zone zero, it's you. It's you. It's, if you have family, it's your family. If you're doing something on a community scale and you have several families sharing a piece of property, then the collective total is design element zero or zone zero. Because this is this is what got me doing this show today. I get emails. I'm going to read kind of what I wrote here. And you're going to think I'm picking on you if you sent me this email this morning. And if you happen to hear this, do not think I'm picking on you because I wrote it the way I did with all the blanks in it because I get this email a couple, three times a week. It's always different, but it's always the same. It'll say something like that, this. Jack, you're a jerk. Because of you, I now have X, I now have X acres outside of town. We're excited to move in. I'm in zone blank, and we get blank rain. The soil is blank, and I want animals including blank, 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 and maybe blank, and possibly blank. What should I grow? What do you What do you use for a cover crop? Can I put a lake in and raise ducks, or will they ruin it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sign some person. So I get this all the time, and I, I'm glad you got land. Please keep telling me you got land because that makes me happy as shit. You can keep sending me these emails. Do not think that I'm complaining about this. You may never get a, a you know a, a free permaculture consultation by email from me that tells you exactly what to do. In fact, you never will. You may get an answer. You may get, hey, I'll talk about this on the air. You may get, hey, check this episode out or check this series out or something like that. Um, but I can't actually tell you the answers to the questions you have because it would require me to do an analysis of you that would take me at least two hours and I don't do consulting. And I would primarily base that design on the questions that I'm about to give you. And the problem with these emails, again, this is not picking up you. I've been this person. I've made mistakes right here on my own property because no matter how much you know better, when you get property and you get some size to your property, you start thinking, I want the trees in first because the trees take the longest to grow. And I'm going to go plant 300 trees this month and I got to get that done. And if I don't get that done, I, I, there's another day before I plant trees is bad, right? Or whatever it is, or you've been obsessed with something. You've wanted chickens your whole life, and now you can have them. Or you wanted to have cattle, or you wanted to have sheep, or you wanted to have rat. Like, whatever it is for you, and you're obsessed with that thing, and that becomes priority one. And inevitably, it probably should be something more like priority 25. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that trap today. We're going to lead off with how things go wrong, especially with homesteaders and permaculture-minded people. 
We spend a lot of time listening to podcasts, reading articles, reading books, watching videos, etc. We look at tons of techniques and we confuse technique as permaculture. So this is a hugel mound. So it's a permaculture. No, it's a hugel mound. It is a single thing. It is a single element in design. It is a technique. A swale is a technique. It is not permaculture. Planting 10 different trees in a guild is a technique. It is not permaculture. A keyhole garden is a technique. It is not a permaculture. It is an element that may or may not be inside a permaculture design. And so people chase the technique or they chase the element. And they do it in the absence of first developing a strategy. A strategy, your overriding strategy, is what you want the property to do in the end. Okay, so if you were designing a car, you wouldn't start with the motor. You'd start with, what kind of car do I want? What do I want the car to do? How much am I going to be able to sell the car for? Where am I going to manufacture? You'd have this whole litany of questions in designing a car. And the motor would be pretty far down the list. And the reason it would isn't because it's not important. Without the motor, the car doesn't go anywhere. That when you, when you got all the other design elements, it would literally be that this is the kind of motor this car needs. Right? Like, Or this is the kind of motor this design allows us to budget for. And so you would never start with the motor or the tires or the rims. I don't care what kind of 70s or 80s kid you are in your heart. You're not going to start with 60s and Krager Max. Not if you're going to design a car. Now, if you're if you're restoring a 68 Chevelle, okay, maybe you, you would do that. But if you're designing, and so we're not restoring something to somebody else's design. We're designing it for ourselves. So we start with a strategy. And that strategy is, is, is built around how, can I say it with one sentence? Probably not, but you could try. I want my property to, and then you explain what you want it to actually do for you, what you want it to be like, how much time you want to work on it, et cetera, how much production you want. And you have that overriding strategy. And then every time you consider a technique, you say, does this further my strategy? And there's there something that would further my strategy more quickly or more permanently that I should do first. And that's where we get into tactics. So we're going to use strategy and then we're going to choose techniques and we're going to tactically implement those techniques so that they're done in the right order, the right place, the right time, and the right way. So a swale is a technique. A strategy is I want an overstory food forest as part of my final design. Okay. Tactically, where does that swale go? When do I install that swale? That's tactics. So until we get into this hierarchy of strategy drives tactics, which are implemented with techniques, we're always going to do things in, in a bad order. And many times we're going to actually do things that we should never even do. And we end up with a type one error. And the more you're emotionally vested in the thing, the technique right? Or the individual element, the more likely you are to do something in spite of yourself and do it at the wrong time, the wrong place, or maybe even put a design element onto a property that shouldn't be anywhere on it just because you want it. Instead, if you had the strategy guiding you, you would come to a realization, this element, this technique does not tactically fit my design. I still want what this thing does. So why did I want it in the first place? And what technique, what design element, what tactical implementation will result in that for me? All right? So that's where we're coming at this. And this is, if you understand what I just said, then with a little bit of effort and some trial and error and some experience, you're going to be a fantastic permaculture designer if you want to. Because it's what most of them don't do. Most of the best permaculture designers look at a property. When I say best, I mean, they're very good at what they do and designing systems the way that they want them designed. And they're like an artist that sees a piece of marble 
and they go, I'm going to make, you know, Michelangelo's like, I'm going to make David. Well, maybe the customer doesn't want David. Maybe the client doesn't want David. Maybe the client wants a Jaguar. Maybe we need to turn the marble sideways and make a Jaguar out of it. If I don't, and so what happens is because they're so good at what they do, and they know so well what that final design will look like. And you'll look and you'll see all their designs are very, very similar. And it's not that they're bad. It's that that may not be in the best interest of the client. You have to design for the client. In this case, you're designing for yourself and you need to treat yourself like a client. And so I would sit you down if I was willing to take you as a client. And one more time, I'm not willing to take you as a client. But I would ask you these questions. I would say, how much weekly time do you really and honestly have in a time budget to do work for new installation, design, development, et cetera, implementation, and how much time do you have for maintenance? And how do the and can we see a point where that starts to transition that you're not building forever? Hopefully, hopefully we're building and then maintaining. So, but we need a budget of hours. A lot of people say something like twenty hours a week. And you go really? You tell me what days and how many hours each day. And, and 20 becomes 10 really fast. Well, I didn't really think about that. Two hours after work. Well, what's after work like? Well, I get home about six. Well, it's dark half the year after six. Right? So, like, you have to, you have to, like, as a consultant, you have to push people. So now you have to push yourself to be honest about that number. Because my next question is, how much time are you actually going to devote? Like, you because you you've honestly assessed and you say I, I legitimately have 15 hours that are budgetable time where I won't completely hate my life. I won't have to skip the kids game. I won't have to like not turn in reports at work or whatever. Like 15 hours is what I legit. I, 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 that's what I have. It doesn't mean you're going to actually follow your time budget. And I find that people generally fail by about 25 to 30 percent. So try to check yourself with that. And when you do, take that number and make it your actually budgeted time that you have. And you might find that you're being honest when you're building, but not when you're maintaining. I find that people get really excited about projects. So it is not uncommon for somebody to put in two full eight hour work days building garden beds or something like that, or building a chicken coop or something. And when that gets done, then we go back to weekends going to soccer games or going fishing and nothing wrong with that. We're not doing this to become slaves to our land. So that is more of a movable time budget. That's like, well, when I'm in construction, I will work, you know, at least a full work day on a weekend. So maybe it's two, four hour days and then the rest of the time for screwing off. But you've got to be honest about this. And then you have to be honest about what is that, what does that time budget look like for net? Because when you're building, it's kind of easy. And the reason it's easy is everything's brand new. You build it till it's done. And then you build another thing. So as you when you build the first thing, let's say you put your first thing you happen to do, and I'm, this is not what you should do. This is what you decide you should do. Put in four raised bed gardens. So you put your four raised bed gardens in. There's nothing else to take care of. That's good. That's what we don't want to go too fast. So we build our four beds. Maybe it takes us a couple, three weeks. It's no big deal. We bring some soil in. We make some compost, whatever it is. And we put it in there. We get it going. We set up our irrigation and we plant it. That entire time, if that's version project zero one, right? You had nothing else to take care of except daily life, which will never go away. Like the kids need to go to the store or whatever. Now you've got a garden. Now you're like, I know my next thing that's going to go in this design is I want a small flock of chickens. Now you're building a small chicken coop. You're setting up a run or a tractor or whatever it is you're doing. While you're doing that, now you got to take care of the garden. You see how this works? Yeah. Every time you get ahead, you also get more maintenance work. So now you've got your chickens set up. Now you've got to take care of your chickens every day, take care of your garden and do project number three. So we need to start understanding that as we build more, we're going to have to put more time into maintenance. And that's why we want to be smart with our design and design our elements with one of our tactics being least amount of daily maintenance possible 
and rapid repair to catastrophic failure. How would that work? For instance, I have aquatic systems, as you guys know. So if I had an aquatic system, a pump fail, if I didn't have another pump, then I've got to figure something out. I've got to rely on a backup from that same system because I put two pumps in every system. I'm, I'm running an air compressor, you know, and running a, a stone. But if I just standardize, and this is what I've done as a design tactic, I've standardized on two pumps. I have a little 550 and a 2,000 gallon per hour larger pump. They're made by the same two, two different companies, but they're the same everywhere. I have one of the 550s and one of the 2000s on the shelf at all times. I've already opened the box, gone through it, plugged it in, made sure it worked, threw all the crap that came with it away that is useless to me, and have the the uh, the electric cord in it, all the uh, tie wrap off it, everything's ready to go. And so if a pump goes out, the procedure is grab the pump, take the pump, the dead pump out of the system, one minute job, put the new pump in the system, plug it in, one minute job, two minutes, and I'll give myself four minutes to walk to the shop, get the thing and bring it out. If the old one is possibly repairable, I stick it in the box and I put the box not on the shelf, put it on the workbench to remind myself. That's tactics, right? And that is a design feature that all of my systems are designed to come apart quickly by hand, no tools, and be swapped back in. And so anything we design, we need to minimize the amount of daily, weekly time we have to pay, do something with it. Because as you're developing these projects and you're, you're, and you're saying, so next week I'm going to begin project three, inevitably what happens is you end up spending half the time you budgeted to project three fixing project one or dealing with things you didn't expect. So when you're starting, instead of trying to go as quick as you can and feel like you're not getting it done fast enough, enjoy the simplicity and get that one thing bolted down and then go to the next one. All right, let's keep going. So what's our budget? We talked about a time budget. What's our money budget? How much coin do we have to do this? A lot of people don't do this. They figure out what they want, and then they figure out how to pay for it. I, I actually don't have a problem with that. I think that makes a lot of if you If you do it the way I'm talking about today, and you're doing a logical progression, everything you do should, in time, put money back in your pocket, not actually be a true expense. Um, but if you don't have some budget in mind, because your budget's not unlimited, your budget's not... $20,000 a day, for instance, right? Just to be a little ridiculous. So if you say I have a thousand dollars a month that I can put into the development of this property and you end up doing a project next month for $2,000, you've eaten two months budget in one budget. You may want to, but you should know that's what you've done. And that keeps it in bounds of reality. And then we take time. And then if we find a design element that's going to be really beneficial, but expensive, then we figure out, do we really want to do this? And do we, do we have the surplus capital somewhere? And we know we've gone over budget. So what's our budget? As a consultant, I don't like asking this question because I know what the customer's thinking. He wants to hear the biggest number possible so he can spend all my money. As a consultant in permaculture, I'd be giving you a design that costs what it costs. I just don't want to design something for you that you're not going to have the budget for. But when you ask somebody, when you're doing like marketing work for somebody or a uh, website design or something, and because this is this does happen. You go to a web development company and you say, I want to get a website design. And they say, what you, you say, what's their budget? And you say twenty thousand dollars. They're building you a twenty thousand dollar website. Now, this is a little side, right? Just not understanding how to negotiate it. You go to that same web company. You tell me you had a ten thousand dollar website. They're building you a ten thousand dollar website. It's probably the same website for both customers. So that does happen. But don't, if you're working with a permaculture consultant that's doing design, your design should cost what your design costs. And that question is really important. And when you're doing it for yourself, that question is critical. Otherwise, you're going to be designing shit. You're going to design the way realtors get you to design in your head, where you look at a house and go, but this isn't an open floor plan. Just, oh, just take that wall out. And you're like, Okay, clown, is that a load-bearing wall? Do you know? Because I do, and it is, 
right? So there's a there's a three thousand dollar metal beam going in there to do that before we even talk about the rest of the work. Assuming that you know the up, so you you that's what happens to you. You do it to yourself. Well, we'll put a pond here, and we'll put like a thousand acres of forest here. You don't have the money, so don't deceive yourself. Or you're going to have to get the thing done. You're going to have to do it maybe a longer but cheaper route. It's pretty cheap to put a thousand trees in from seed or from cuttings versus from potted or uh, bare root trees. So you have to be honest about that budget. Okay. The next thing you have to ask yourself is what do I know I am good at? Like people say, would you always tell people to put in a garden first? Do, if you have experience as a gardener and you're a good gardener and you know how to garden and you haven't done any of the other things that you want to do, I would put a garden in first because you're good at it. And because it means that you will have a solid understanding of where to put it, what the solar aspect's like, how to locate it from your house, how to maintain it. So once it's done and you're going to the second project with something new, you know how to handle the maintenance. So if you're already good at some things, I would focus on implementing those things first. If you're not good at anything, you're probably not asking the question, right? Because you're probably good at something, right? So you want to know what you're good at. And I think that we want to start there. And then, so once that garden went in, we're also going to have a waste stream. So we can think about a composting system that goes to the garden. And maybe then we think about a livestock feature, like a chicken system that we can marry the waste stream to the chickens for the compost. Yeah. But we want to do this with logical progression and starting where you're strong is a lot smarter than starting where you're weak. Yeah. Uh, next. <sighs> What do you eat? This is a, a strange question in that it's not asked enough. Well, what do you eat? Because people walk in and start naming species because it's impressive to a client, right? Well, you know, what would fit really good in this system is Cornelian cherries. Does this person eat fruit? Did you ask? Do they want fruit? You know, is, 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 or is this a person that wants to mostly raise uh, livestock? It's probably not the right species. For the last, so you know, what do you eat and what do you want to eat long term in your life is really important. It helps you select crops, but it also lets you prioritize things. The person who's going to be primarily carnivore, like me, might really want to start thinking about fodder trees as an early crop to get in, just ringing the property, especially if you live in a climate, it won't require irrigation to do it. It would make a lot of sense. You're also developing a screen, but then you want to, again, logical progression. Is there someplace that screen needs to break because you don't want to compromise the solar exposure? And there's other elements we're about to get to that would, you know, maybe you shouldn't plant trees here because access, et cetera. But we definitely uh, want to analyze our diet, our diet and our preferred diet, because we don't want to put time and energy into producing food stuff that we don't eat unless we actually have a plan to market and sell it. And a plan to market and sell it is all market and sell it. That is not a plan. A plan to market and sell it is where you're going to sell it, who you're going to sell it to, how much you're going to charge for it. You know, it, is there a supply available in the area already? Who are your customers? That's that's a different element, right? That's a business element. Um, what natural pathways exist on the property? We're going to dig deeper into access as we go down this list. But when you look at a property, you'll notice that there's kind of a natural way of the property that people walk through. And in fact, most of the time you can see, even if there's no pathways, worn areas from human or animal traffic, like a deer run in the grass. And if you, if you really want to see it, when it's really got a lot of dew on the ground, wait till everybody that lives on the property does their morning routine and then look because the grass is flattened even if it's normally not and define those natural pathways and then determine if those natural pathways are really there because they make sense or just because there was nothing that created an alternative for the pathway you might find that the reason the pathway is in this straight line is it's the quickest distance from from the front door to this place that someone has to go to every day well, maybe we channel that or maybe we 
we actually create a path that actually undulates a little bit because if we have to walk an extra minute to the mailbox or extra minute to the chicken coop or an extra 30 seconds, it may not really hurt us in our overall time, but it may give us the ability to direct activity. And what I mean by direct activity is if I have to go let the chickens out every day and I'm going to give them scraps, I might as well take the scraps with me. And if there's something along the way that would involve me picking up more scraps, then I would want to direct that path through there. So if I had uh, a garden and it wasn't in a straight line to the trick chicken coop, it was off to the side. I might want to develop the pathway around that garden so that I go by it, see the weeds, throw them in the bucket, take the bucket, let the birds out, dump the scraps, pick up the eggs in the same bucket, and go back to the house. Right. And I won't ever see that opportunity if I don't identify the existing pathways. And as I start designing elements, understand, OK, there's not a garden there, but there's going to be. So I need to start developing this pathway, this access now, because if I develop the access now, when I have a helper and that helper could be hired labor, it could be a spouse, it could be a kid, it could be a next door neighbor's kid. There's a lot of different ways that happen. If I design it that way, then my, my learning curve is dramatically flatter. It's much quicker to get that person up and running because follow the path. And you think, well, no, anybody would understand just to go to the garden. No, 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 they won't. Trust me, I've run enough businesses and I hate having employees for a reason. No, they won't. You have to channel and funnel activity. So define the natural pathways. Then another thing you really need to do is ask yourself, what are the most valuable natural resources on this property? What is the most valuable stuff here that's 100% natural, that's not man-made, that's not synthetic? If you had a pond, that would probably go really high on the list or a creek or something like that, right? But a lot of times what people don't see as a resource is a resource. Let's say you have a, a piece of the property that's heavily treed and you, you, just, you know what? I, just, I don't want to do anything with it. But what you have there is shade, biomass, and you have habitat. You want to, you want, even if your plan is not to do anything with it, it should be considered in your design. You have to think about what does this mean to the whole? And you also want, when you find these natural resources, to make sure that you're not destroying them. So if you determine this clump of woods is the one of the most valuable resources you have, and you have other open territory, and you decide, I absolutely do want a pond or ponds, I'm not cutting these trees down to put a pond in, just because it would be easy to get a pond in there once those trees are gone. Because I've now defined that natural element as highly valuable not just to the property, not just to my eye, but to my strategy. Always come back. What is my strategy? What am I working to obtain? This is where we we in the West fall behind the East heavily in this, like a global politics scale. When you look at nations like China or Japan, what they do, they do with strategy. Everything is for a larger purpose. And I'm not talking about geopolitical Right now, I'm talking about like the average person is living their life with a strategy in Japan right now. Most Americans are living their life at the seat of their pants. I think there's some place for both. But when you're designing a lifestyle, a property, a business, a website, then you design with a strategy. And you're always asking, how does this further my strategy? Because you might get an answer you don't want. Not only does it not further my strategy, it actually defers my strategy or obstructs my, my strategy. So then you have to decide, did I have the strategy right or do I have the strategy wrong? And do I adjust the strategy or do I address the tactic? And that's always going to come from those, you know, answering these questions with honesty. And so what is the most valuable natural resources on the property? Next question then is, what are the most existing valuable uh, human-made infrastructure components to this property. You know, that might be fencing, right? It would be, a, or outbuildings. Or are there roads or paths? Is there anything that was built on that property that is extremely valuable? Usually the most valuable thing is the house itself. 
but you want to make note of every piece of infrastructure. And is that infrastructure valuable? And if so, if, if, what does it require to maintain its value? So, I mean, one place that I'm weak on this right now is I've got some spots on my back fence because it's on my neighbor's side where there's like trees growing in the fence and all. Something's going to have to be done about that because that fence is very valuable to me, but trees eventually will kill fences or render them useless, right? Once you can climb a tree to get over a fence, is it really a fence anymore? The answer is no. So we want to identify all the critical infrastructure and all the valuable infrastructure and determine how it fits in our strategy. Does it, right? Do we need to move it or relocate it to further our strategy? Because a lot of times people think, well, I'll just move that. Well, should you? What's it going to cost? Is it going to damage it? It's a tough shed. Okay, yeah. If it's a small one, it might be, you know, forklift attachment on a freaking front end loader or something. But a big one, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Do you, does this really make sense? So identify all the critical infrastructure and all the valuable infrastructure and make a list of all these things so that you can sit down and look at them. And when you're thinking about doing something, just review your list and review your answers to these questions. And fear not, all these questions will be in the audio notes. There's a link in the video uh, notes below if you're watching the video. All of these notes will be in the episode notes for 3285 of the Survival Podcast. All these questions. Use them. Expand them. Come up with your own. But make sure you document this stuff and you review it as you're developing your designs and making your decisions. It will save you thousands and thousands of dollars across time and hundreds, if not thousands, of hours in wasted work. And wasted, you know, wasting your dash, basically, because in, instead of building a thoughtful design where if you have a day's work to do or a half day's work or a couple hours work or an hour's work to do, you can make one lap and you're done versus going back and forth. That's what a lack of design gives you. It gives you a lot of wasted energy that can be spent doing other things. Uh, next, how does, uh, I'm sorry, um, which areas do we require what access to? And how can we create said access or ensure we do not obstruct it if it already exists? A thing that I see happen very commonly with smaller properties. I even have one place where I did it a little bit, but it's because of how things grew in, honestly. But swales taken too close to the edge of the property line up against fences. You know, you, if you have a swale that ends and there's a fence past where it ends, you should easily, whatever you mow lawn with, that better be able to easily fit through that space twice. You know, you want to think about that because that's going to obstruct access. If we put in a swale, we might want to put an area where we actually cover it and put a culvert that connects two open swales together. So we have a drive over would be an example. But we need to really think when you plant trees, you've obstructed access. So you need to analyze the property. Where is every place on this property that I would ever need to walk comfortably? That's one type of access. The next would be like, I want to be able to get into this place minimum with a wheelbarrow. Right. The next might be, I want to be able to get in here with a four wheeler with a trailer behind it or a tractor with a trailer behind it, like a little lawn tractor or something. So it doesn't require the access that a truck has. I want to be able to get into here with a vehicle. I want to be able to get into here with a vehicle pulling a trailer. And you need to be clear about that so you don't do anything that obstructs your ability to do that in the future. Because trailers are tricky. We've got to turn them around. So either we're going to build a turnout or we need a place where we can jack around with that trailer and get back out of there. Or even if we can get in, it's meaningless if we can't get back out with it. So we say in permaculture, when you are looking at land for design or even like a you're considering it buying it, the three big things to always think about water, access and structure. So we're starting with access. So where do you think we're going next if we're starting with access? Uh, now we want to talk about water. So what you want to ask now is how does water flow on this property? What hard catchment do you have? Are there any natural water systems? Could there be any natural water systems? Should there be natural water systems? And you might look at a, a smaller property, let's say a half acre. 
And you might think, yeah, I don't think I really need to worry about how water flows on this relatively flat half acre. Oh, but you do. And you need to think about how any particular tactically, in, it, it, tactically uh, implemented technique will change this. If we put in a path, it's nice and flat, gravel, it's going to let water come in and it's going to percolate water off both sides if it's flat. If it's kind of flat, but it's kind of running like a swale on a slight downhill, it's going to percolate water downhill from it. If we put anything that's raised up, it's going to retain water from the upgrade side. You put in a hole, it's going to catch water. When we have a property that's not that big, but we have a, a standard typical American four bedroom, two bath house. We have a pretty big roof. If we properly understand how water flows, we can probably use nothing but rainwater to do every bit of irrigation that that property needs. We have a bigger property. We have a lot more catchment, soft catchment, land catchment. And we can use that to build, you know, ponds or even just water absorption pits that are never actually designed to be long-term ponds. Maybe they fill up for a day or two in heavy rain and the water, water percolates in. But we need to understand that. And we need to think about the general slope of the property, all the hard catchment, all the soft catchment, and where water ends up when it rains. And, and through all of this, understand, you might make a first pass at this, and then you're going to refine it with what we call due diligence, which is observation and feedback across time. When it pours... When that rain stops, go take a walk. Where are the puddles? You'll discover even on relatively small property, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, the water's moving to here. And you'll know it's there because you're walking around in it up to your ankles in the mud. I've seen people completely ignore natural catchments. I had a person ask me, will you come take a look at my house? I'm like, said yes. And I went out and I looked and they had basically shrubs that the prior homeowner planted like box shoves that you do with a freaking uh, hedge trimmer. And it was built into like a brick wall in the front of the house. And I'm looking up at the roof and going, this is a, this is a natural wicking bed, basically. There's no irrigation. These shrubs look great. It's the middle of August in Texas. I'd get rid of these shrubs and plant something. I said, now, understand, this is what I would do. But if you want an easy place to grow a perennial shrub, I'd grow them right here. I'd take that one downspout, I'd put in some collection tanks, and I'd overflow the collection tanks into a four-inch piece of perforated pipe right inside this rock wall retention. And it's basically a terrace that you're, 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 you're watering from underneath. It's not a true wicking bed, but it's going to have no erosion and then I would, you know, at this point, knock a hole in the wall and, and let water out before it fills the whole thing up like a like a tank. And I don't know if they did it or not. Right. Um, but that is an example of that was a water catchment feature in the property not being hard, utilized. And it was there. And if you had asked the question and walked around and asked where you could retain water, anybody would have seen it. I didn't see because I was a genius. I, I saw it because. That's one of my questions when I look at property. Where does water flow? Where could it flow? And where can it be retained and soaked in? Yeah. Um, next, what are the structures like? What do they need? Or what should be done with them? What are they going to need? You have a barn. And you're like, I can keep you know, livestock in there. I keep, uh, well, okay, great. Well, how long, how long is that barn going to last without maintenance? So what maintenance is it going to require? We need to... Think about having uh, a way to make sure we have the budget necessary to do that maintenance. Or maybe that maintenance needs to be done before we do something we're more excited about. Right? We need to, we need to think about that. What is that, what is that structure shade? Right? What, what's, what's on the, the, uh, the north side of that structure? You know, is there an opportunity there because it's, it's mostly shaded all the time? What's on the east side? If you're in our hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, right? Because that means you're going to have kind of the most golden standard for a garden, especially in the south where it gets too hot in the middle of the day. You're going to have great full morning sun and afternoon shade. 
So I'm not saying if you have a barn that has a nice area on its east side that has that, that that's where your garden should go. I'm saying you should think about whether or not a garden goes there because it's like, it's probably a good place for a garden. It might not be though. That's why you have to do this for yourself. So that's part of that infrastructure question. What opportunities does the infrastructure present to us? How does that lead our design? And what I mean is if we have a place where there's here, let's use my property because it's the real world. It really happened. I moved in here. There's a 12 foot by 16 foot tough shed that had been being used as a goat barn over just near my West pasture. It's got a fence around it already. Guess where the ducks and chickens are living. They're living there. Would I have bought that 12 by 16 shed to keep the small flock of chickens I started out with and put it over there and put the fencing that's around it, around it. No, I did it because it was there and it worked well for what I wanted. That then dictated other design elements on the property because that's where the chickens are. That is That just magically turned into part of my zone one design. It has to be part of my zone one design because they are living creatures that need food, water, and to be let out every day and to be looked after and have eggs picked up. So when you're designing a property, that piece of infrastructure needs to be noted, pathways to it, how water flows around those pathways, how people flow around those pathways, how animals flow around those pathways, how waste streams flow in and around those pathways. And as you begin to map this out, you can start doing like rough notes where you do bubble diagrams. And then start making connections. How do the chickens connect to the compost? How does the compost connect to the worm bin? What goes to the worms? What goes to the chickens? Where are the worms located? You know, you have to start thinking about all of that as you do this. Next, how does the sun move across the property at different times of the year? Um, what microclimates does that create? You might have some spots that in your summer are blazing hot. Probably don't want to grow much there in the summer. But you might want to set it up so that animals can use that spot to warm themselves. Like you might create a rockery somewhere like that, put in some really hardy desert plants, or at least really hardy heat-tolerant plants, and create a lizard system there so that you are attracting lizards into your property so you have lizards eating your pests. Or you might just want it to be aesthetically pleasing as a rock garden or something like that. But you might also have a place that's dramatically cooler. So this starts with just making a solar exposure map. And I recommend a tool called Sunseeker. You can get on Android or Apple, Sunseeker. And you can set it and say, to let's say um, June 21st, which is the summer solstice. And it'll show you, with you can hold your phone and look, it'll show you the exact path the sun takes across your sky. It's probably not what you think it is. It's like, look, rises in the east and sets in the west. Yeah, at a macro level, but here's an example with my property. South is, is this way for me. And my sun comes up over there. It comes up in the east, but it comes up practically in the northeast. And it comes way out to the south, and it sets way back over here when we get into those long days of summer. In the winter, it's much more a low in the sky, east to west arc. So that tells me where my warm places are at the coldest time of the year and where my cool places are at the warmest time of the year. These microclimates are important. And I really recommend that everybody, for many reasons, this being one of them, have an inexpensive E-Tech City thermal gun. You can find them on my website. Just search for E-Tech City at the survivalpodcast.com. They're usually on sale for under 20 bucks a lot of times, or they're in the $20 range. And you can walk around and you can start making thermal maps and find these microclimates. Because then when you have a, a plant that has a need of just being a little bit cooler than it's typical in your climate, you find that niche. Or one that needs more warmth, you find that niche. The other thing you'll find then is ways that you can create places for your animals that need to get out of the heat if you're free ranging. So they'll naturally find that. So since they're going to, you might want to know it's there so that you don't put a thing there that's very attractive to them. 
just as an, uh, for instance, because I have this great barn in the back. It's got a couple oak trees on the east side of it. I put my garden over there. It shades the garden in the, in the heat of the afternoon. It's a great location for the garden. But the garden is two foot raised, two and a half foot high raised beds because ducks don't get up on two and a half foot raised beds. Because guess where the ducks spend their August? They're all over there. They're under the oak trees. They're eating acorns. They're eating insects. They're in the duff from the oak trees. They're hanging out. They're literally leaning up against the garden and hanging out there. If I had put, now with ducks, if I put a flat garden anywhere, I'd have issues. But I would really have issues there. So that garden would either need to be raised up like I've done or fenced or something. And if you didn't do that, you're literally taking the magnet zone for the ducks when the plants are under the highest stress from heat and bringing the ducks into the garden. So that's just one example. You want to know where these microclimates are and you want to know what advantages that gets you. Start listing them. And you might find, like, you, I, I look at that spot and go, if I'm going to do mushrooms, that's the place. I've even given it a go. I've given up on mushrooms here. It just gets too dry to do it outside here. So I just don't do mushrooms. So just because it looks like it might be good for a thing. Again, don't get into the realtor trap where they're like, oh, take this wall out and then just, you know, redo this floor. And your realtor walks in and they sell you this house and they just rattled off $80,000 worth of work and you don't have a budget for it. Don't do that to yourself. This, this keeps you in check if you take this methodical process. Um, how much rain do you get and when do you get it? There's people like, well, how much rain did you get last year? And I'm like, well, well, that depends. Like last year, when did the year start? When did it end? We're talking January, January 1 to December 31? Or are we talking about the last year since now? Um, I know I always get really decent amounts of rain in my spring. A good year here, we'll get over 40 inches of rain in a year. Right. So people think it's a desert and it can be and it has been for the past couple of years. But four years ago, we got almost 60 inches of rain. But we got almost all of it in three months in the spring and then three months in the fall. And so then we had three months on both sides of it. Very cold and dry, very hot and dry. And when you don't have deep soils. Hot and dry hits you a lot harder. And we don't have deep soils. And there's no way we can make them. We have, to, we have to think about that design element on my property. You may not. But you want to know how much rain you get when you get the rain. And then you want to do what Brad Lancaster calls plant the rain. So we want to take that other information we have about how water flows. And we want to maximize water into the ground during that peak of rain. It, a way to really understand this is the irony that permaculture design in a desert, you're always designing for a flood. It's very counterintuitive. No, I'm, I'm, I'm designing for dry. No, you're designing to a flood. Because the desert will get 10, 12, 8 inches of rain a year, some less. But it's still a ton of water per surface area. And so the drier the climate, the more we need the system to, to hold on to every single drop of water that we can and put it into the ground. So it's, it's, it's really important that we get that answer, how much rain and when and what's typical. And when you answer that question, don't just take your average and be happy. Take your average, design to the average, then take your high years and design catchment to that as much as is reasonable for you or as much as you need to. But then also take your, your, your lowest years, take like, your, take your four lowest years in the last 50 years, get an average of that, and design to the minimum of that average low. And if you do that, then you're smooth sailing in all but the most extreme swings possible. And if you do that, then when you're designing larger earthworks, you're floodproofing yourself. You're not going to have you know dam wall failures and things like that as well. Design to the 100-year flood in large-scale earthquakes works um next ask yourself what grows native in your area some people don't do should what grows here what grows like if you take a walk on a wood lot a random regrowth 25 year wood lot 25 year old wood lot 25 years ago it was a field now it's a now it's a wood lot what's on there which trees which are basis species which plants do they have analogs 
if where you live, you walk around in the spring and you see um, wild, weedy amaranth growing everywhere. Well, if you if amaranth fits the rest of your strategy, it's probably a good plant to grow. Because if wild, weedy amaranth will grow, then, you know, human selectively bred, more purposeful, useful amaranth will probably do well. If we have um, lamb's quarters, then something, uh, geez, I could, it just went away from me right now, but there's a plant that's a Mexican plant that's basically a version of uh, lamb's quarters. Holzontle. Holzontle will probably do well. So we want to know that. What are people growing commercially? And that may or may not be a good thing to grow. One thing you'll do, know is the climate is appropriate for anything people grow commercially. People, unless they're growing in like a heated greenhouse or something and hitting a niche, people that grow commercially do not grow climately, climate in, inappropriate crops for the area because they can't afford to. Now, they might grow water requirement inappropriate. So growing cotton in the desert in Texas is probably highly water inappropriate. But the temperature, the climate, the sun, the season length, obviously cotton does well there or they wouldn't be growing it there because they can't afford to. So by asking those questions, you start to uh, come up with some ideas about what you should be doing. You can look at this from a livestock standpoint as well. What what livestock's grown in your area? And that'll help you start to figure things out. What's already on the property? Yeah, it's funny to watch people talk about, well, I need to figure out a pioneering tree species. And you walk around their property and go, well, that's a hackberry, and that's a hackberry, and that's a hackberry. And they're like, well, but it's not in the list of pioneering species. Well, it's, it's pioneering right now. I have them on my property. I have oaks that are dying because the whole area is infected with oak wilts. Uh, a lot of my oaks have turned back around, but a lot of them were too far gone when I got here. And everywhere an oak dies, a hackberry grows. If I needed trees to plant right now on a broader scale, if I had a project here, I'd be making baby hackberries. Because I've got hackberries that are freaking eight inch diameter trees that are 40 foot tall that are seven years old that grew by themselves from a seed. So I've got a tree that's large. It produces a deciduous leaf drop. It's not a high value plant, but it doesn't hurt anything. I and, and rat, uh, moon sprout says rabbits love hackberry, right? It's a fodder plant. You know what else loves hackberry leaves? Geese. They don't seem to care anymore now that they're grown. But baby geese, when they were goslings, they ate the, the hackberry leaves like crazy. I've got mulberries self-propagating. So they do well here. So I want to plant more mulberries, right? Because they do well here. They're native here. They And this just doesn't get looked at. Everybody watches these videos and, you know, the marvelous sepulcher of the Alps and he's got a lemon tree and he's got a golden orb around it. And, ah, yeah, he's not selling lemons, folks. He's not a, a lemon producer. He did something to prove it could be done. That's cool. I'm glad it's inspiring. I ain't following suit. I don't want to do it. There was a time I wanted to do something like that. And I realized this is dumb. I'm not going to dedicate so much resource energy into growing a lemon tree when I can grow a persimmon tree and get lots of persimmons. So what's native to your area? What's grown commercially in the area? What has done well for homeowners that's not maybe least maybe seen as a productive species but has an analog? That would do well. Um, next, what what will require irrigation and how will you provide it? I think the biggest mistake people make is not installing irrigation. And I take that and I am including you're going to put in a garden. It's going to be two four by eight beds. It's not that much work to go out there with a hose and water it. And there was a time in my life where probably water in my garden kept me from going and punching somebody's face through the back of their head because I would get home from work, grab a beer and go water the garden. But I could have figured out something else to do with that time. And if that garden would have automatically watered itself first thing in the morning and first thing in the evening, I would have got even more production than I did out of it. So if you're going to require irrigation, put the irrigation in when you build the thing. 
if it's not going to require irrigation, but you need to put in, let's say, rain catchment, like you're going to channel overflow water from your roof into a series of little micro swales and then have pits at the end of them and then build like a wing berm around the pit and plant a tree behind it. Okay, before you plant the tree, do that. Again, back to Brad Lancaster's advice, plant the rain. Drip line, uh, Ronald is saying use a, a drip line. Yeah, I don't care how you do it. What I'm saying is if you're going to put plants in that are going to require irrigation, put the irrigation in before you put the plant in. Because other things will always become more important than that. You'll just, I'll water it, I'll water it, I'll water it. And then you go on vacation and you leave somebody to take care of your place. It's actually really good at what they do, but they just don't know everything you know. And you come back and your fig tree is nearly dead. Even though it's a desert species, it should be able to survive. Well, it, it can't, hand, once the temperature goes, like you know things that nobody watching your place will ever really know, no matter how good they are. Even if they were there when a lot of them was put in, you, you as the owner, as the manager of the property, will in time know things that you won't even realize you know. If I'm walking past one of my ponds and the pump is getting clogged, but it's not clogged, there's no danger for a few days, I hear it. And I know that needs to be cleaned out. And I'm like, yeah, I can clean it. I can put it till tomorrow, but I'm going to put it on my, you know, bullet point list of things that must be done tomorrow. I already did that just because I heard it. Nobody that watches this property is going to get that in tune with my systems. Nobody's going to get that in tune with, oh, look at the way they're just, those plants in that bed are just a little tiny bit wilty. That soil's just a little too dry. I need to go ahead and, and bump the bump the irrigation on for an extra 10 minutes today. No one's going to do that for you. So the more you automate with irrigation, the more you won't have to worry about that. And when you have to run out of town for a week because something happened, like a family member died three states away, when you come back, everything will be good. You're going to put a garden in. You're going to put a bed. If it's going to need irrigation, irrigation goes in when you do it. At minimum, here's what I've done in situations. Putting, I put the, the four huge garden beds in around my big pond. And I didn't know what I wanted to do for irrigation when I put them in. I still ran pipe underneath everything during the install. Because you just threw the pipe on the ground, throw dirt on top of it. I stubbed up a pipe in every individual bed and put a glued a cap on it. Water's there. And then that made irrigation really simple to install later on. You're going to put swales in. If you ever think you're going to irrigate, even if you're PVC pipe is cheap, lay it on the ground, throw the swell berm on top of it, stub it up, hook it into your system, throw hose bibs on it. But if you need to do irrigation later, it's all there. It's all ready to go. If I had to do it again, when I put my berms in, I would have put down two sets of pipe and I would have gone ahead and put irrigation everywhere. It's a mistake. I'm telling you about my mistakes so you don't make it. If you're going to need irrigation, put it in when you do the initial install or planting. Um, it will never be easier than it is when there's nothing in the way. Uh, next would be, do you want animals? If so, which and why? This is where people get in real trouble. I, this is the emails I get. Well, I want rabbits and goats and chickens and ducks and blah, 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 and donkeys and peacocks and elephants and gira uh, giraffosauruses and whatever else, right? So my first question to somebody like that is, have you ever kept animals ever? And I don't mean your dog and cat. And they almost, and the person that says they have this list like 80 animals long, no. Okay, <laughs> pick one. Do all the infrastructure for it, then get the animal, take care of the animal for a several months, and then think about if you want another animal. And then if another animal can be cohabitated, get that one next. So if you do chickens and you're like, I want ducks, chickens and ducks, they do fine together, right? If you want chickens, ducks, and pigs, I would say get your chickens, get them knocked out, Get your ducks, get them integrated, then build your pig infrastructure. Because you'll learn a lot by taking care of chickens and ducks. 
when it comes to animals, you also want to ask yourself, why do I want those animals? Right? Why do I want those animals? And you, you want to answer that question in more than one way. Because if I want them for food, well, what does that mean? You want chickens for eggs? Or you want chickens for chicken? Do you want a small flock of egg laying chickens? And you want chickens for meat? If you want chickens for meat, then part of your designing and meeting your strategy is if your strategy is I don't want to work too hard. Well, then I want to pick the optimum time to incubate eggs or to buy broilers, to start them and finish them before the heat of summer, let's say in the South. So I don't have to worry about keeping them alive in the heat of summer. So I want to start them late enough. They won't freeze to death. And I want them early enough that they'll finish as early as possible in the summer because it's a short duration meat crop. And then I probably want to grow if I can, if I got the space for them enough for my full year and I don't have to do any more meat chicken work until next year. That makes a lot more sense than keeping this huge flock of chickens that makes way more eggs than I can ever use just so I can eat one whenever I want to, which a lot of people end up doing. You know, so you want to know the animals, which, the why, and the infrastructure for them. Um, <clears throat> what's your waste stream like? And then how is it going to connect to your design? You know, that's part of what you eat. What what do you end up with? But what is your total waste? And this is an ongoing one. Your waste stream will evolve. So as you do a lot of planting of perennials, you're going to have a lot of pruning. And you're going to have a lot of hard, woody waste that when you first move in, you won't. So this is an ongoing moving target. If you start, let's say you're a person, you listen to my show on Monday, you're like, Jack's right. I'm a grain eater. I don't care if he's a carnivore. I like grain. I'm going to start growing a significant amount of sorghum grain. Okay, you're going to have a lot of silage or compostable stocks that you didn't have when you got started. So that waste stream is going to move. And you need to constantly be adapting. How do I process this waste in a way that's beneficial to the system as a whole? You might end up like, you know what? I didn't think I needed a worm bin, but now that I have this particular waste stream, what a great way to, 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 to compost it. Or you might end up finding a waste stream that's not yours directly. There's one around you, right? Uh, and you can get a lot of a waste. And you're going to say, well, I'm not going to do the Billy Bonds thing. I'm not going to raise pigs. So I don't have a bunch of pigs to feed this stuff to, but I want to feed it to black soldier flies. And so you set up your black soldier fly, your first bin, you get it operational, it works, you figure it out. Now you might invest in infrastructure. You might have a bunch of biopods. Well, now you're producing tons of black soldier fly. Maybe you're feeding those to your birds. Maybe you have a business out of that. But now you have another waste stream you didn't used to have. No, wait, Jack, I just got rid of the waste stream. Well, no, you have a waste stream because black soldier flies don't make compost. Black soldier flies make frost which is a nice way of saying maggot poop because a black soldier fly grub is really a maggot. It's a big maggot and it poops. They are so fast at eating waste that they're faster than microbes. A vermicomposting bin is worms and bacteria. And I guarantee you in any good worm bin, you open up, you're going to see little gnats and roly polies or something or spring tooth. There's lots of critters in there and they are working in combination with microbes so those worm castings you get are a combination of worm poop, yes, but they're, it's also a highly digested ground poop, right? Because worms actually take grit in like a bird and grind up, and they're eating a lot of lignin and carbon-based material, where a black soldier fly doesn't want anything to do with lignin. Doesn't want anything to do with, you're gonna, you ain't going to feed them straw or dried leaves or something like that. They don't want that. They'll go underneath it. They're la happy that's there, but they're not going to eat it. And because of the way they act and because of the microbe structure that they have, when you pull out your flies, the stuff that's left is basically not ready to be used as compost. So now all of a sudden in that design, vermicomposting goes perfect because I take my frost into my vermicompost and I get some of the best vermicompost in the world. Now I have an income source if I want it. And I can do it large scale or I can do that small scale, a couple pods, 
couple vermicomposting bins. It's just fertility and food for my livestock and fertility for my garden. But if we don't ask these questions, we don't get to that place. Or we get there, but it takes us 10 years instead of 10 months. So we want, again, start with that strategy and build to it. The biggest mistakes that I've made here have involved seeing this place as an education site, which on some levels it is, but I don't run like a workshop a month. So I got way too spread out in the beginning. I got way too many. Like I justified anything I wanted to go mad scientist on just on, oh, when students come here, they can look at it. And they could pick the, where I've really moved in the last few years toward making it the way it needs to be for us. And then when you come here as an education site, you get to learn how it works for us. And that's a better way to go, right? And, and it's part of how I developed this mindset of design is getting discombobulated a bit, chasing things that I just wanted, and then realizing, hey, you would never advise somebody in your audience to take the approach you are. So why are you doing it? So understand when I'm giving you this advice, it's, it's, it's hard one. Um, do you have dogs, cats, pets, and how do they fit into this? I have a, a brother, or what do you call him? I guess you call him a, a nephew-in-law, my niece's husband, right? Uh, I guess that's your nephew-in-law. Uh, they wanted me to look at their backyard. And as soon as I saw the size of it and the fact they had two big dogs running around, I'm like, there's not much you can do here. And they had like a fence that was see-through fence and the neighbors had dogs and the dogs spent all their, and all the neighbors had dogs. And so the dogs spent all their time running up and down the fences, barking at each other. So it looked like a dirt trail for like a dirt bike all the way around the fence. Well, you can't, you're not going to put anything on that fence. You're going to have to give up your dogs. You're going to have to come up with a different way to control your dogs, or this is not going to work. So hopefully if you're looking for a homestead, you're looking for enough land that you don't have, like the existence of a dog does not preclude the existence of a homestead. But in some situations, a dog is really detrimental to trying to grow much if it's too small of a yard. And if it is that dog a dog that you go outside with, or is that a dog you open the door at eight o'clock in the morning, you put the dog out and you leave him out there all day until you come home from work at night. That dog is going to do a lot more damage to a piece of property than a dog that goes in and out. So you need to think about how that fits into it. And is there any way they can be beneficial to you? If you have an outside dog, right? then there is, you're going to have a very low predator problem, right? So now we can start, or you're also going to have a low pest problem in a lot of ways. So I had a, for instance, when I had my property in Arlington, Texas, pretty small property, about a third of an acre, I had a couple of peach trees and they would get loaded down with peaches. And even though our dogs are not really outside dogs, when the peaches were almost ripe, those dogs were pretty much out all day long because if I didn't do that, the squirrels would come over the fence and they would take a peach off. They would take two bites out of it go, that's not very right. Throw it on the ground. And you'd get this giant pile of dead, you know, useless peaches. And you can only shoot so many of them with a gamo before they figure that out and they get smart. But when you put the doggest Maximus out there, they don't come over the fence anymore. So that was like strategic use of the dog, right? So you need to think about every living, moving element on your property and how it relates. If you have cats and they're outside cats like ours, like the, the place we keep our, our feed is the place that the cats have decided they want to live. So they're in the front shop. If my cats had decided they wanted to live in my back shop, I would keep my feed there because those cats sleep on an old couch out there and they're literally looking right at the feed. We don't have any rat or mouse problems at all. And when we moved in, we did. That's why we got the cats. But then once we got the cats, I'm like, well, what do the rats want? Well, the rats want food. Okay, let's put the food where the cat is. And then we'll just let nature take its course. So think about every living creature. It moves, disturbances that it makes, dogs poop, they dig holes, etc. So you got to think about that too. Do you want or do you have a business on site? And how will that function? And how does that fit into it? Sometimes that means the business is part of the design in that I'm going to have a, if, like I said, I think there's, there's money in growing dirt. There's an old joke. Hey, the boy's got a farm. What kind of farm? He got a dirt farm, right? It's a joke, right? But the, it's, there's money in dirt farming. If we're actually talking about is compost and soil and humus. 
I watched a video today of these, these guys. They're doing vermicomposting and some other composting, and they have a market garden and all that, but they make most of their money selling worm castings. They're selling cubic yard sling bags of worm castings for like 1600 bucks, And they're getting all of the food for the worms for free. And I don't know if you know much about worms, but if you buy worms to get started, you, unless you do something really stupid and kill all your worms, you just can keep making more and more worm bins. You take a handful of worms, put them in a new bin, and you're off to the races. And I was looking at that going, well, these guys added black soldier fly to this mix, and we're doing what I said and going soldier fry frass into the worms, then you'd have the same amount of input and double the output of sellable product. So you want to think about business like that, but you also want to think about like, I bought this property. So part of my pre-property checklist wasn't just, hey, I want to be able to run workshops and plant trees and have a garden and what have you. Uh, I want chickens and ducks. It was, I, I want a property that works for my business. So that was uh, including infrastructure like got to have high speed internet, things like that. So how does your business fit into your lifestyle if you're going to be running a business, even if the business is not uh, you know, a homestead or a permaculture type business? Next, uh, what local waste streams exist, like restaurant waste, mulch materials, et cetera? What are the resources around you? This is one of the places, if you live in the suburbs, you have an advantage over me. You really do. You probably have a smaller piece of land. It's easier to intensely cultivate. And you have all these neighbors that rake up their maple leaves and their oak leaves and whatever, and they bundle up all their sticks and everything. That's a waste stream. Is there a coffee shop around you? Uh, I, I found that like coffee grinds are the easiest waste stream to get your hands on. I've walked into Starbucks and gone, hey, sometimes you guys have bags of coffee grinds out here. Can I? And the guy just said, hold on and just go and get a, like a hefty sack, like a big contractor size one. Heavy as shit because they're wet, full of, of, and they'll just give them to you. So if, if Starbucks will do it like that, I guarantee you your smaller coffee shops where you go in and you talk to them and it's either the owner or the guy that's working there knows the owner on a first name basis. You can probably walk in there with a couple barrels and say, just throw your coffee grinds in there. And if you, if, if they're not, if they, if you run out of space, then just do what them, whatever you're doing with them now, just go back to doing that till I empty them. And I'll, I'll just come once a week with a dolly and I'll pick these up and I'll give you two new ones. And you'll have an endless supply of that waste stream. Endless supply. And it's not something that stinks. That's what makes it a great waste stream. Like if you're doing this with a restaurant, they're throwing lettuce and not scrape plating, scrape, uh, plate scrapings and all in there. Your frequency of pickup has to be much higher because they only want that stuff there for so long before it really starts to reek and it needs to go out in the dumpster and go away. So you want to pick your waste stream based on your availability to go get it. And once you, once you get a waste stream, you don't want to ever lose it because of something you did. You might decide you don't need it anymore and politely go away, but you don't want that person to throw you out because, Hey, your shit's been sitting here for three weeks and you ain't been here. So you want to think about the waste stream relative to your time frame, relative to what you're doing, you know? Um, you know, can you get the waste stream delivered to you? That's the best way. Uh, wood ship, you know, like chip.in, I think is what it's called. I've never gotten chips from that. I've had to go out, drive around, find guys that are trimming trees and ask them to dump it. And they're always like, we got big logs in there. Or whatever. I don't care. Just dump it. Like they're afraid you won't want it. If you know, no, I understand that. I, I have a fire pit in the backyard. Just dump it. Here's two 12 packs of beer. We can't take beer on the job. Okay, fine. There's going to be two 12 packs of beer sitting right inside the fence. And if you can pick them up at the end of the day, you can have them, right? So that's a waste stream. So what are the local waste streams and how can you tie into them? Uh, how old are you? It's an important question. Don't be embarrassed. We all get old. Look at the top of my head. See the gray, the gray stripe going down the center of my head if you're watching the video. Um, but the big reason about asking how old you are is you need to design things and manage your timeline so that you get enough done in a way that's easy maintenance before you get too old. So your design might look different if you're 50 than if you're 30. 
The 30 year old has 20 years to get to the property, to the place that they want it before they're 50. The 50 year old is going to be 60 in 10 years and they're going to be 70 in 20. Sad state of moral affairs, right? We all get old and we all die. Nothing wrong with that. I don't think life would really be worth living if we live forever. Um, but if you're 60 years old and you're still in pretty good shape, you need to know that you're going to slow down a few steps by 70. And those of you that are younger, I want you to know it's right at like 42.5 years of age. Your extended warranty just goes and nobody calls and asks you if you want a new one. So we need to be designing for our older age and we need to have our timeline for doing so commensurate with the reality of our age. I'm in touch with the fact that I'm over 50 years old now and that I will not be physically as strong and fast and agile in 10 years when I'm 60. And so I'm trying to design everything for 75-year-old Jack Spearco. I'm not there yet. I got 25 years to get ready for 75-year-old Jack Spearco, assuming I don't hit by a, gar a, gra a gravel truck or something. But I have to think that way. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm seeing this in our communities, people thinking more and more this way. How do I design the thing that if something breaks, I can fix it even if I'm you know, kind of slow, maybe a little bit longer to do it, but I don't have to be strong. I don't have to get out of jackhammer or, or, or whatever, right? I want easy, and you want that anyway, but the impetus, the older you are, the more you need to have an impetus to get there as quickly as you can. Um, what will be your ongoing budget for upkeep and maintenance? This is important too. Like if you design a system that has a required input of electricity, then you need to have a budget for the electricity. If you buy a property that has a certain amount of property tax on it, that's never going away and it will go up across time. Even if you live in a place where it won't go up a lot, it'll go up. That's part of your input, the financial input of paying that. If you design something that requires uh, feed, so you have to buy in feed for your birds. That that feed cost, unless you do something to produce your own feed, it can go on away. And unless you can do something that's automated to produce feed, it still has your labor hours into it. So you really need to think about the ongoing cost of any design element. What is this going to cost me every month for as long as it's here? And what do I get out of it? Is the ROI there? The ROI may not be financial. You know, your ROI may be more, I think that's beautiful. And I, I, I'm willing to pay to have that in my life. But make sure you know that's what you're doing. Don't trick yourself into thinking this thing is profitable and it's actually a net loss month after month after month. Next, are there any good local examples around you to emulate? Has anybody done this? You know, I'd meet all my neighbors and look in their backyard. You might even... Um, you might even look at somebody's backyard that is not into you what you're doing at all, but you still may develop design element ideas out of it. Like, you know, maybe they have a beautiful back porch and you think, man, I could do pretty much the same thing here, except I can put a wood burning oven in and, you know, what, whatever it is for you. So look around you and emulate. If you have farms around you, even if they're very conventional in nature, you know, I'm not talking about cornfields and wheat fields, but I'm talking about, you know, people that are growing orchards and growing like four different kinds of apples or anything like that. If, you, if they're willing, if they have an open, you know, policy where you can go take a look at what they're doing, go take a look at what they're doing. And there's a lot of times there's as much value in seeing what somebody's doing wrong as seeing what they're doing right. And so one of the questions I always have for people when I look at like, what's the thing that's the most problematic for you? It requires the most time, money, repairs, effort, whatever it is. Like, what, th what thing, if you could make it better, would you do first? And then I'll look at that and say, well, okay, here's an idea. And I, it's really not ab about them, though. It's about if I do that or recommend it for somebody else, how would I do it so that I didn't have that problem or I could mitigate that problem? So look at the examples around you to emulate and also to avoid problems. And the last one I have for you is what are you most excited about doing first? What do you like? Ask yourself, like, now that you've done this and you're thinking about all the stuff you want to do, what, and then what should you do first? And it's almost inevitable that the thing you're most excited about doing 
will probably not be the thing that you should do first. Or you'll say that really is one of the first things that I should do. But then say to yourself, if I want this thing, what are the things that I should do first so that I can have this thing? And where does that fit in my total strategy? Because you might find, for instance, that the, the most exciting thing that you're going to do is not building a chicken coop. But you don't want to go to tractor supply for your chickens at all, by the way, if you don't have to. But you don't want to go out and get your little peepee -pee chickens, put them in your stock tank, put your little heater lights on them, a little water in there. Look how cute he is. Look, you pee, pee, pee. Yeah, okay, pee, 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 poo in your hand. And then you're like, I got plenty of time to build a chicken coop. Because in like four weeks, they're fully feathered. They're about this big. They ain't staying in that bin no more. They're flying out of there. You got them outside in a Rick and Moreau freaking chicken tractor. And then all of a sudden you're like, you're going out and you're buying like a yuppie style $800 box with wheels on it. Chicken coop that you never even wanted, but you're just that it's freaking June. These chickens are, I got to do something. So even if the thing you're excited about is like the first total project, reverse engineer it to, what does that look, what does the path to it look like? And my final thoughts on this is always think techniques, tactics, strategy. The first thing you really need to develop is the strategy. And the strategy in this case is really more the goal. If it's, it's a question when I was, when I was in technical sales and we were selling things like computer hardware and test equipment and stuff like that, the question we would ask, no budget, restrictions whatsoever you have a magic wand here's your magic wand if you could wave your magic wand and have exactly what you wanted in a system what would it look like and there was no way that we were ever going to be able to do exactly the thing that they said but what we could do then is we could then try to construct as close to it as is possible within the budget that they have and believe it or not there were times where like we can do that that's easy it's not even that expensive. In fact, we can do more than that. And a lot of times I think if you ask that, that question of yourself, what do you want? You start to realize what you want isn't what you saw your favorite YouTuber do, right? Who's always doing new things because they need new content. What you really want is you want to produce half your food and you want to work five hours a week. And that might be it. I want half my food. I want to work five hours a week and I want to enjoy walking around my property. You notice I didn't say I want chickens and ducks. No, I want to produce half my food. And then if I like chickens or I like ducks, the question becomes, how do the ducks contribute to producing half my food and making me enjoy walking around my property? And how do they fit with my budget? Now we have a strategy. Now the strategy drives the tactical implementation of the technique. And this is what every good PDC teach, every good permaculture teacher is teaching, but they're not, most of them are not saying it that way. And I think that's a problem. And I think the problem is the solution, I guess, in that if we can start to have our permaculture teachers start to think about how do I explain what I'm teaching from a standpoint of the strategy driving the tactical implementation of the technique, then we can, we can get people to be much more clear on what they're trying to do, right? Because all of the stuff, all of the techniques, et cetera, if they don't give you what you're looking for, right? If, if you put in a system that requires you to work 20 hours a week and your strategy is to work five, then that's not a good system for you. Uh, conversely, a person that's young and retired, 20 hours a week, they might be like, damn, I wish I had more to do because they'll get bored. My grandfather on my mom's side, he was one of these guys, his lawn was like a golf course year round. He had, he put no effort into growing food. My grandmother on that side grew, you know, a few vegetables. She was Italian. So that's kind of a thing uh, at the time anyway. Uh, and some, and flowers. 
But most of the stuff that was done outside was my grandfather. He was a retired warrant officer. He was in his 60s, and he was in a damn good shape for 60s. He was not without energy. And he spent so much time watering that damn grass. And I can look back now, and I know exactly what it was. He needed something to do. So there might be, it might be that 20 hours a week is optimum for you. And it might be horrible for you. So if we don't start with that strategy and include things like, I only want to do this much work. And you might not mind bursty work. So project work, like I said, you might do 16 hours this week just in project work. That, but that, that means you kind of need that five-hour cap on your maintenance, doesn't it? Or you're, not, you're going to have to take from one for the other, and that's when stuff starts breaking. So if we can get that overriding strategy into our mind first, then we can always come back to, does this do what I am said that I said I wanted it to do? And if it doesn't, does that mean I was not honest about my strategy? Or does that mean I'm straying from my strategy? And this should be a lot like the way we manage our lives when it comes to purchases. I want to buy a new car. Do you need a new car? Does it align with your goals in your life? Have you moved along far enough that when you want to buy a new car, you can just buy a new car? Well, God bless you. I ain't going to tell you you can't. But if you're at a point where like, if I buy a new car and you haven't figured out the strategy for your life yet, and it's going to set you back considerably from where you're trying to get to, but you don't know it because you don't know where that is yet, that's a bad decision. Even if it's not, you don't know that it's a good decision. Strategies drive the tactical implementation of our techniques instead of techniques driving our design because most people are doing it backwards. I've seen it enough to know when people see a technique, they like a technique. I want to do that. They go do that. And there, there's some beauty in that, you know, and what is it? Is it a major thing or a mini thing? Like if you see wicking beds and you're like, Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go put a couple of wicking beds out on the deck. All right. You know, that's, that's not, you're not, that's never going to be a type one error. You'll always be, if you can put them there, you can take them away, right? That's not putting a dam in the wrong spot. You know, that's not building a fence that you can't afford to replace that is in the wrong place. That's none of those things. And so there, it, it is okay to just, I'm going to go try a thing and see if I like it. That's fine. But if you decide I'm going to put in 50 wicking beds before you put in one, and you spend all the money to do that, and you put all of this stuff in place, and then you find like, holy crap, I can't sell this stuff. And I'm, I'm growing way too much of things. I don't know what to do now. Well, that was that was a bad decision. And people do things like this. I've seen it done. You know, so anyway, hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Uh, this is one of those shows where I just kind of sit back and riff. And I hope it helps you figure these things out. And again, my list of all these questions, episode 3285 uh, is available uh, in the audio notes. And if you're watching the video, it will be up in just about an hour after right now, if you are watching it live. If you want to help support this show and the work that we do, remember, you can always do your online shopping at tspaz.com, T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Today's item of the day is one for the kitchen, pork king good, pork rind <laughs> breadcrumbs. They're also sometimes called pork rind panko, and they are exactly what they sound like. They are ground up pork rinds. And so I've had people ask me, why would you buy these things in a jar? Why wouldn't you just take a bag of pork rinds, grind them up and, and use them? Dorothy and I used to do that. We didn't use them very often because you'd be surprised at how small an amount a whole bag of pork rinds is. Uh, a jar like this can cook a lot of meals before you run out. Anything a breadcrumb can do, this will do. It makes great binder in things like sliders or meatballs and things like that, especially if you mix the meat and leave them sit overnight. That's really kind of the way to go with that. I even give a recipe here uh, for, uh, Buffalo sliders with blue cheese crumbles. It was pretty freaking fantastic. Also included a, uh, Poblano pepper. Uh, it was one of the better things I've made, but you can bread stuff with them. I'll tell you right now that if you use a fine almond flour and use that like your flour, when you do a three station dredge where you go into like an egg and milk or egg, I use egg and whole cream because it's really sticky. Then go into the almond meal then dip again in your egg wash and then go into your breadcrumbs. It does really, really well. One of the best things we made with this, my wife was kind of craving 
Uh, back in the day when we used to eat anything, she would sometimes make like shake and bake pork chops. She wanted something like that. I went out and got some pork chops, beat them flat, put them in a Ziploc bag and beat them with a, a, a meat hammer and uh, flattened them out thin and, and did them like this. They were fantastic. It doesn't stick quite as well as real panko. It takes a little bit of effort, but my grandma Spirico trick, my dad's mom, whatever you're going to fry. And even if you're using breadcrumbs, this is, this works or uh, anything other than a batter. Cause a batter is like, it has to go straight in the fryer. Do your dredge work in the morning, stick it in the refrigerator, fry it in the evening, let it set up on there. And that works mm -hmm. wonderful for all types of things that you would put any kind of uh, breadcrumb, cracker meal, et cetera, on. So anyway, you can always find all my stuff right at tspaz.com. That'll take you to just a sub page on the website. You can find the deals of the day, the current item of the day, all of our categories for everything. And if you start your shopping right here, no matter what you eventually buy, you help the survival podcast and the work that we do. Also consider becoming a member. Um, Renegade Butcher. Uh, is now part of the MSB and Renegade Butchers right here in the live chat. That's Josh, the Renegade Butcher. Well, Josh has a pretty cool website. He sells some awesome seasonings and uh, mixes for sausage and stuff like that. And I have eaten the stuff that he makes. Fantastic dude. That's why I just added him to the MSB. He's also, I just added him to the Expert Council. And today, officially, even though it's a soft launch a week ago, he is now part of the MSB and on the benefits page. I do need to get a uh, blog post up for you, Josh. I just haven't done that yet. It's been a busy week, but he is absolutely renegade butcher. Uh, going to be an is now part of the MSB. So welcome to that. And I want to say uh, thank you to everybody out there that is an MSB member because you are the reason, guys, that I'm able to do what I do here five days a week for you. With that's been Jack Spirico with another edition of the Survival Podcast. And Mike V, thanks for the $10 super chat. I really appreciate it, sir.